I'm Fred Roser. I'm the president of the Hall County Historical Society. And one of the things we do is put up historic markers. And this is, I believe, marker number 23 that we have in Hall County. Uh, the Hall County Historical Society started originally by putting up markers in 1922. And they put in seven stone markers that commemorate the California and Oregon trails across Hall County. And they start out at Harmony Hall, and they go west as far as uh, where the Platte Valley Academy used to be. Uh, and today we're here to commemorate this, uh, the people that perished out here on load line number four. And we work with the Boy Scouts. And this is our third marker that we've had a, a Boy Scout working on his Eagle Award. And today we have Alec Paul, and he's our uh, the, the newest Boy Scout to do a marker for us. And we really appreciate all the effort he's gone to to, to do this. And we also have Howard Urich that's going to talk about this site and everything here. So I'll turn it over to Alec right now, and he'll tell you about it. Um, thank you all for coming. Uh, I've been working on this project for about two years, so it's been quite a long time coming. Um, so this plant was used in World War II and quickly built uh, in World War II to make bombs. And it was located in the middle of the country, you know, Nebraska. That way it couldn't be hit or the plant couldn't be bombed itself. So the event that we are um, here to commemorate today actually happened on this day 74 years ago. Uh, on May 26, 1945, there was an explosion in Line 4, Building 10, that killed nine people and severely injured one. The explosion was felt all the way in Wood River, and they could even hear it in Wood River, too. I mean, it was just a massive explosion. So that's kind of what we're here to commemorate today. And there, i got to get my note card, but there are a few people I'd like to thank. First off, the Hall County Historical Society, because they helped you know, get everything together, and specifically Don Dietenmeyer. He helped coordinate everything, and um, he's the one who told me about the project. Uh, the Wood River Community Centennial Foundation gave me a, a large grant, so that all went towards this project. Um, Steve Reel, I don't think he's here today, but he's the Hall County uh, Public Works Director, and so he he helped me uh, make sure that I could build this on this site and everything, and also this large pile of gravel, which will eventually all be spread out there and it was used right here too he donated all of that to us you know no cost at all um, Woody's welding so this this marker right here was uh that he's built that one and then copycat put together what's inside the marker which we'll unveil in a little bit and then finally Howard Urich because he kind of helped coordinate everything or he let Don gave Don all the information and then uh, he's actually got a whole museum on this, on what happened here and the ordinance plan. It's all very, very interesting. So I'll hand it over to him. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, I've been putting together uh, some history and some information here for a program I was going to do at the Wood River High School. It was a friendship gathering on a Saturday morning. The first one was going to be in February and it was canceled. It was actually rescheduled for March. It was uh, predicted to be a blizzard that night so we, we didn't do it. And then in March there was a call late in Friday night uh, said we better reschedule it again. There's going to be freezing drizzle after midnight and icy roads in the morning so they didn't want any of us out on that. And uh, so then she says, I can't reschedule until I see the school calendar. But now we're going to try to do it on June 9th, hoping there ain't a severe thunderstorm warning that day. But we went, we moved from Saturday to Sunday afternoon. That'll let my friends at work and haul fertilizer and fuel and stuff be able to come to it. Um, I'm going to use some of the stuff here that I did prepare for the program. It's really interesting. It gives uh, the complete list of the the victims here and their um, ages and if they worked for for uh, maintenance or production. And um, I'd like to open this up. Might need two hands to hold this if this speaker here works. Or... Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, I'm going to skip some of the stuff that I'll do in my program. Don't want you to hear all of it today. 
but I have a list here. Employees killed. Lola Britton, she was 28 years old from Grand Island. She was the wife of Corporal Elmer J. Britton. He was out the Grand Island Army Airfield. Betty Ledford, 19, from Grand Island. Mark Burke, 59, from Grand Island. James Moon, 54, from Taylor. He was a Cornhusker corn Ordnance Plant dormitory resident. Earl W. Brown, 64, Grand Island, husband of Leela D. Brown, Line 4 cafeteria employee. She was probably working out here the day her husband died. Um, Albert Otto Schultz, 26, of Wood River, a maintenance man at the plant. George Wilkins, 56, from Cushing, a maintenance man on the line and a resident of the Cornhusker dormitory. Also, Fred Abraham, 41, of Grand Island, foreman of the room that where the blast occurred. And Ambrose Welch, 49, of Greeley, a maintenance man. Uh, I'd like to continue with a little more here. This, ha this was in the plant newspaper. They put them out every two weeks or every monthly, I'm not sure, during World War II. It was called the Co-Planter Magazine. And this article was in there on June 8, 1945. It would be the first, article, first magazine printed after the explosion. It said, General Manager Meyer Andovec of the Cornhusker Ordnance Corporation, they were the plant operators. He was attending a meeting in Florida when the explosion occurred. He arrived in Grand Island that evening by plane. The force of the blast demolished the entire building and the concussion shattered windows in the line office and other buildings on the line. Um, the, the blast was heard in the administration area of the plant some four miles away, although no concussion was felt there. Residents in nearby towns Wood River and Carroll reported feeling the blast and it was heard in several places in Grand Island. There was no damage to the plant other than the wrecked buildings and the shattered windows on line four. Debris from the explosion was shattered over an area of several hundred yards. Alice Hanfelt, 30, an electric donkey operator, had just left the building with a load of totes. Uh, she escaped injury miraculously in the blast. Mrs. Hanfelt, whose husband is in the service, said she heard the noise and slammed off the switch to her machine. The next thing she knew, she was blown from her seat by the concussion and lit on her feet outside the ramp. She ran all the way to the first aid station through the debris without receiving a scratch. Clifford Riley, the superintendent of Line 4, was seated at his desk when the blast occurred. The concussion knocked him from his chair and shattered glass all over his desk. He escaped injury in the blast only to step on a nail when coming out of the office. Uh, Grand Island emergency units were summoned to the scene of the blast and Schultz was taken to St. Francis Hospital in the emergency unit. Hall County Coroner John F. McCarthy was called and authorized removal of the bodies of the victims. The bodies were later taken to Livingston Sonderman Funeral Home in Grand Island. All personnel of the line were evacuated immediately after the blast to the change house cafeteria. Evacuation by workers was orderly and calm. There was no confusion among the employees. Other operating areas were immediately shut down and employees dismissed for the day. Operations were resumed at the plant at midnight the following day. I have a list here, the funeral rites for the victims. They were held as followed. Mrs. Lola Britton, her funeral was May 29th in St. Stephen's Catholic Church at Lawrence, Nebraska. Burial was at Lawrence. Betty Lou Ledford, her service was May 29th in Livingston Sonderman Funeral Home. Burial was in the Grand Island Cemetery. Albert Otto Schultz, his funeral was May 31st in the Presbyterian Church in Wood River. Burial was in Grand Island Cemetery. 
Mark Burke, May 29th, funeral service and burial was in O'Neill. James Moon, May 29th, funeral services and burial at Sargent. George Wilkins, May 29th, funeral service and burial at St. Paul. Earl Brown, May 29th, in a Methodist church in Arnold. Burial was at the Arnold Cemetery. County Coroner John F. McCarthy stated Monday, June 4th, that after an investigation, he deemed an inquest unnecessary and identified Fred Abraham and Ambrose Welch as those bodies that have not been recovered. Their death was at the time of the explosion. I also have a little something here. You're probably all wondering what caused this. And it could be a number of things, but safety first was always the rule. But I have something here to read. I read a report on the explosion that was included in some items sent to Gene Buddy from Don Haydenfelt, who was an engineer at the plant until it closed. He furnished a copy of the explosion investigation report. Among the results revealed, the explosion originated within a radius of one foot near the bottom of the north kettle. This radius would include the bottom of the agitator, the strainer in the kettle, and the Hills Mechana valve. Weekly inspection of the Hills Mechana valve diaphragms were made, but they were not changed until absolutely necessary. Examination of the diaphragms at them times revealed they had been punctured so as to allow some molten TNT to seep in behind the diaphragm. Most of these punctures were in the center of the diaphragm and would allow a metal insert of the diaphragm to strike against the seat of the valve when it was closed. It is believed that such an impact would be sufficient to detonate the thin film of explosives between the seat and the insert. Other diaphragms that were examined also showed presence of foreign materials such as nails or wing nuts was embedded in them. The impact created by a metal object in the diaphragm striking the seat upon the closing of the valve is sufficient to initiate such an explosion. Now we talk about a Hills Mechana valve and the kettle and everything. The building was three stories high. I have a picture here of the building that replaced the explosion. The kettles were on the second floor and the product that went into the kettles was taken to the third floor on the elevator. They would take up ammonium nitrate, TNT, and they'd, they'd melt some of the TNT in a, a, pre, in a, a grid and it would make it liquid and they'd run that in the kettle and then they'd add uh, ammonium nitrate and more TNT and aluminum powder and mixed up a batch of, of liquid about like wet cement and then it was it was run through this Hills Mechana valve which was on the bottom of the kettle that was up at the ceiling on the first floor the bomb carts were pulled underneath and a rubber hose put in the casing of the bomb and an air valve opened that bladder. It would open that rubber diaphragm and let the product seep through and then when they would push the valve to close it off so they could move to the next one, that was the on-off valve. And apparently this uh, investigation reveals that that could have been the problem. And I thought, how did they know that happened at the bottom of the north kettle? And I got to thinking, well, they had a lot of witnesses, you know. They had people that was up in the change house that were up there for dinner. Um, they had some maintenance men working in there. Most of the employees were off at dinner time. And I think they probably even asked this Alice Hanfelt that drove the donkey out of there. They probably asked her what was going on when that happened. She probably said, well, Fred and Ambrose was working on the bottom of North Cattle. And that's probably what I'm assuming, Cir circumstantial evidence probably points to that uh, maintenance problem on the bottom of that kettle. Anyway, it was a terrible thing. Uh, you notice all the, the victims there, there's quite an age group. Uh, there was a youngest girl, was a 19-year-old girl. The oldest was about 64 years old. Uh, when Albert Schultz was killed, he was 26, he had two children, and he had a couple brothers, and we have one of his children right here, this is Kenny Schultz, I think he was two years old. It, it, 
<laughs> I, I, I've known him from high school days. Uh, you have a sister, Karen. Is she here? They, uh, his uncle, Wilbert Schultz, is here. Wilbert's over there. He was, yeah, Wilbert was the younger B Schultz boy. He was 14 when his brother was killed. Wilbert lived uh, with the family down south of Wood River, and he said they felt the explosion that day. Poor Wilbert didn't know what happened until later when, uh, when his brother never came home again. Anyway, I don't have any more. I wanted to share that stuff with you, and I'm going to do a program on uh, more of this information. I've got pictures to show. We've got some videos that my daughter took when we we walked, we retraced the steps going into the line, and I've even got it on that large one there. It shows them arrows. That's how we walked in there, and I talked about it, and it shows the ramps they walked through, going through the change house where you would uh, get your time card punched and all that. And uh, the large picture there was given to me by a friend that worked out here on the railroad after the ordnance plant closed. It was one in one of the offices up there at the class yards. He gave me that. I was so tickled to have that on line four. And um, this building that blew up would be out there north of where the pivot point is on this pivot you see here in the background. There's a water tank down there. Uh, building 10 would have been probably another a distance of two of them pivot towers about that far north and you can see it there also where we're standing is the lower arrow that's potash that uh, kind of explains it I guess that's all I know about it <laughs> I'm going to turn it back to Alec Yeah. All right, we're going to reveal the markers. Uh, so the, the first one, this tall one, is uh, done by the state. So. Um, it says the Cornhusker Army Ammunition Plant. Commonly known as the Cornhusker Ordnance Plant, the facility opened in 1942 and covered nearly 20 square miles. During World War II, it produced artillery shells and various bombs weighing up to 2,000 pounds apiece. An explosion on May 26, 1945 killed nine people, leveled the building, and was felt in nearby towns of Cairo and Wood River. The, plant, the cause was unknown. The plant ceased operations a day after Japan's surrender, but was reactivated during the Korean and Vietnam Wars. And at the bottom, it just reads Hall County Historical Society, Nebraska State Historical Society, and Wood River Centennial Community Foundation. And this one, uh, it has four images that were given to me by Howard Urich and then all nine names of the people who died that day. You can feel free and come up and look at it and uh, take pictures if you'd like to. Thank you. Oh. Howard would like to say something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, those pictures uh, were in Gene Buddy's possession. After he passed away, his wife told me to look through all the stuff he's got. And I believe I heard him say at one time, them pictures come from Howard Eakes. Howard Eakes was from Eakes Office Plus. He was founder of that company, and he worked out here during World War II as an instrument technician. He worked on scales and stuff that they used to weigh products. And he had them pictures. I think, I think there's about eight or ten of them and I show them again in my program that we'll have at the school. It's just amazing what damage is done there. It's just, uh, uh, I couldn't believe that uh, that the explosion under that one kettle could level that whole building to do as much damage as it, as it did, but that's uh, that's why I guess they told everybody to practice safety, but it was an unfortunate accident. Uh, 
all. Uh, yeah, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate it. Like I said, I've been working on this for a pretty long time. And um, yeah, feel free. Please feel free to approach it and take pictures and read it and stuff. And yeah, thank you all for coming. Congratulations. Great job.